Well, good morning. That's, that's a very helpful introduction, that, isn't it? That's a helpful signal as to when to, to start. Thank you for coming again to uh, this seminar. And uh, Niv is going to be speaking uh, on the subject of Jesus, fully God, and fully man. So I'm sure that will be very interesting. It's nice to see uh, a lot of you here this morning. We wondered how this morning would be, given that there's also the, uh, the seminar stream with Count Them All In, and a number of people I know will have gone to that. Uh, some of you have asked, will these sessions be recorded? Are they being recorded? And the answer is yes, they are being recorded, uh, and they will be available uh, later. They're not available at the moment. They're not live streamed like the main tent and, uh, and so on, but they will be available uh, so you can pick these up uh, later. But let me uh, hand over straight to Niv, and before I do so, let's just uh, ask God to bless this time together. Now, Father, we thank you that you are the great and sovereign God. And Father, we thank you for all the wonderful blessings you've given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can call you Father. We can know you in that deep and intimate way. And so, Father, we ask you to be with us now as we look at this very important subject uh, that has caused such consternation over the, uh, over the years, over the centuries uh, in the church. Uh, and, Father, we pray that it wouldn't just be academic learning from our point of view, uh, head knowledge, but actually something that would uh, really captivate our hearts as we think of Jesus, the Son of God, being fully God and at one and the same time being fully man. We pray for Niv as he brings this to us, that you'll help him uh, to bring to us what you've laid in his heart as he's been preparing. And we ask for your blessing on us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Steve. And I am really grateful for all of your uh, attention and attendance. Like uh, I was saying to Steve earlier, with so many amazing options for these seminars, you do me a huge honor by coming. Um, and thank you so much for great questions. I've been saying to everyone, the highlight for me at Keswick has been how thoughtful uh, you all have been. Um, so thank you. Keep them coming. And like the past couple, my aim is to keep 15 to 20 minutes open for that. Think up any questions you can. I really can't guarantee answers, but I can guarantee the best, um, the best response I can give and the most honest one as well. God willing. <laughs> yes. Okay. So today, as uh, Steve has said, we are thinking about the reality of what theologians call the incarnation, the enfleshing of the Son of God. Think about the fact that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And uh, I want to begin with a key passage, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 12. Next slide, please. Um, feel free to dig it out of your uh, Bibles. This was so important. This was so important for the early church as they reflected on who Jesus is. And it's not an, it's not an overstatement to say that this passage gave some of these minds everything they needed to work with to talk about the fact that Jesus is fully divine and fully human. So Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 11. Paul writes, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What beautiful words. What glorious truths. And we will be thinking about them as we go through. Next slide, please. So, to pick up roughly from where we left off, after Nicaea and Chalcedon, the church had reached a watershed. What we had was a situation which the Trinity, God's three-in-one nature, could no longer be understood as three different beings united in one will. Not like three people who decide they're really going to work together on a project. You couldn't think that anymore. The view of Arius had been excluded in favor of the truth that God is one being in three persons. So that meant real clarity around the person of Jesus as fully divine. You could no longer say that the Son of God was 
a rung lower than the true God. You could no longer say that the sun was somehow by nature closer to the change, decay, space, time, world of creation. That was off the table. But as clarity about the sun's divine nature increased, now questions arose about the state of his human nature. Yes, fully divine, but to what extent human? Which is what we're thinking about today. How do we speak faithfully about Jesus as one person in two natures, human and divine? But before we go, remember, I promised you a fact at the start of every one of our sessions. Here's our fact today, and it's an important one. It's a reminder that all Christians are sinners saved by grace. So it's very tempting to think that all, all the heretics were just bad guys. And then when it comes to truth versus heresy in the church, it's as simple as good guys versus bad guys. I don't know if any of you read Harry Potter. Uh, there are four houses in the boarding school. One of them called Slytherin is where all the bad guys come from, more or less. Makes you wonder why they have them. And it's easy to think that heresy is as simple as that. People have just been sorted. They're the bad. It's not quite that simple. It is true that the heretics were on the wrong side of the truth and therefore needed to be strongly condemned in the strongest terms. Their positions had to be excluded. And as long as the persons behind them held to those positions, they too had to be excluded. But that's not to say that they were somehow supervillains. The truth is these disputes got very bitter at times. And if you look at the characters and how they acted, nobody comes out of them very well, because actually that's how conflicts work, isn't it? We clash, and sometimes we clash very hard. So it's true that those who fought for orthodoxy were on the right side of the truth, but it's also true that some of them were very shrewd at politics. It's also true that some of them fought very hard. Some of them had strong, passionate, angular personalities, which in God's providence, it seems he raised up just for that moment, to defend the truth. And we should be so grateful for that. But you might not have found them easy people to have dinner with, for example. Athanasius of Alexandria, would he have been wonderful company? Yes, if you agreed with him. <laughs> Probably not if you didn't. So please let's not think that those contending for truth were somehow perfect, just like every other Christian sinner saved by grace. And let's not think that the heretics were all 100% evil, no one is 100% evil in that sense. They were wrong and needed to be corrected and excluded while they were wrong. Okay, now a really important thing to get here, though, is that the people we're talking about, Irenaeus and Athanasius, and we're going to mention someone called Cyril today, and the Cappadocian fathers, it's really important to get that because the truth of the church is not a matter of superheroes versus supervillains, they were not working alone. They were not working alone. Athanasius has sometimes been called Athanasius contra mundum. Have you heard that? Athanasius against the world. Because when all was lost for the church, he alone stood up for the cause of Nicene truth. Which is a lovely fable, but it's not strictly true. Even Athanasius depended on a lot of help from a lot of friends. Especially the monastic movements in Egypt provided him a refuge and a secure buttress to stand against the lies. Even he needed a little help from his friends. And the truth is, everyone we're talking about is standing on the shoulders of countless faithful Christians whose names we will not know. Men and women who read their Bibles, prayed their prayers, went to church, shared the gospel, and perished in worldly anonymity but provided the truth and support and foundation, humanly speaking, on which all the people I'm naming could stand. So it's not about brilliant individuals. Yes, we needed them and the Lord raised them up, but alone they could have done nothing. And if you come to this seminar track and you say, as some of you have kindly said to me, gosh, you're saying so much, it's just hard to take it all in. Don't worry, don't worry. Take in what you can. Ask the Lord to teach you what we can learn. I don't know everything there is to know at all. But let's be faithful. Let's read our Bibles, pray our prayers, go to church, tell the gospel, because those are the things God used as the real building blocks to keep his church. The brilliant individuals came up from time to time as they were needed, but could not have done it on their own. And that gives us a little insight into something really important that a fifth century Christian called Prosper of Aquitaine called Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi, 
which means the law of praying is the law of believing. In other words, the way Christians pray and worship is what showed them the difference between acceptable and unacceptable, between true and false teaching. Let me give you a couple of examples. Athanasius is contending with Arius, who wants to say that the first person of the Trinity is called the unbegotten. But Athanasius has a brilliant response. He says, Jesus never taught us to pray, our unbegotten, hallowed be your name. No, it's our Father, so that's a non-starter. Arius wants to separate the Father from the Son, but Athanasius points out that when we are baptized, we are baptized in the name singular of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. No separation there. Do you see how the basic ingredients of Christian faith, the things that they're reading the Bible and praying and doing in church, that gave Athanasius all he needed to work with. So this wasn't just a philosophical debate. So the truth is, all the brilliant individuals we're talking about, who I find fascinating, all they were doing was helping unpack the riches and treasures that every Christian has in the gospel. And that is very relevant to today's session too. Because the thing is, what people try to do was keep Jesus' divine nature secure by somehow isolating it from his human nature. So that somehow his divine nature was kept safe from the world of muck and mess and human reality. But you know, that was always a non-starter. Attempts to insulate Jesus from the muck and mess were always doomed to fail, and here's why. Because Christians who follow Jesus and take up their cross and suffer with him never discover less of God, but more. And when they suffer with Jesus, they don't find themselves further from the God who made them, but closer. Because it turns out that in Jesus, the fully divine son chose to inhabit the sufferings of our world. Right. So that's what we're going to think about today. Next slide, please. And so the basic point we need to see today, and it does involve a bit of technical vocab, ask your questions when we get to it, is that Jesus is one person in two natures. To make it really simple, he is one who and two whats. That is a simplification. Don't push me on it. But if it helps you understand, one person in two natures. And the church believes that because there are angles from Scripture on Jesus, that only makes sense if he's fully divine. He's doing things only God can do. He's receiving worship which only God can get. He is named with titles that only God possesses. At the same time, there are angles on Jesus in Scripture that only make sense if he is human. He's born and grows, hungers and thirsts, suffers and dies. Wasn't last night's um, evening celebration a helpful view on that? As the perfect man, he's asleep. As the perfect Lord, he can calm the storm. Both those angles colliding in that account as we see it. And we have to make sense of both of those angles. That's what passages like Philippians 2 are actually doing. Jesus, in very nature, God, but not weaponizing his equality with God. Rather, stepping into human nature in the form of a servant to humble himself for our salvation. But the truth is, it's very easy to get Jesus' identity wrong. And we're going to look at three heresies, three errors that did that today. There are more than three out there. And we can talk about some of them in the Q&A, but here are three. The first one, next slide please, comes via Apollinaris of Laodicea. Now, Apollinaris was on the right side of Nicaea. He was scandalized that Arius wanted to demote the son to not being fully God. But his solution as to how Jesus could be fully God was itself a problem, because it meant compromising the son's humanity. The way Apollinaris worked was that he was able to say Jesus was fully God by taking from his humanity so that he was no longer fully human. Here's how. For Apollinaris, and he probably shared this view with Arius too, the Logos, the second person of the Trinity, the word from John 1, entirely replaced the human soul, the human will, the human mind of Jesus. So that the way that Jesus can be fully divine is that there is a gap in his humanity where the soul should be, and the divine nature slots in there. 
Now, what was attractive about that at the time? Why was Apollinaris threatening? Well, here's the thing. The Logos, do you remember we talked a bit about this yesterday? Not yesterday, Tuesday. The Logos is the one who gives coherence and rationality to the whole cosmos. He is the theory of everything, if you like. And so if you have the Logos dwelling in a human being, why do you need any human reason? Why do you need a human will if you have that divine will? And so the rational faculties of a human Jesus just seemed unnecessary. Why should we even have them if you can just slot the Logos in where they go? And you know, there are modern versions of this too, although they're a little bit harder to spot. But you'll see it any time someone offers you salvation in a way that bypasses the human mind, the human will, the human rational faculties. Whenever, whenever anyone encourages you to come to God in a way that leaves those behind or acts like they're somehow unworthy, then what you're dealing with is a modern-day Apollinarianism. And again, it's a tempting shortcut, not having to bring our minds and wills to Jesus, somehow thinking that they can just be left behind and the reality they point to just diminish in the wake of God. But that's why Apollinarianism had to be rejected. And there's a beautiful comment from Gregory of Nazianzus, and um, I think, yeah, I've put it up there. Let me read it. It's a, it's a nice, long letter he writes, but let me read you a little chunk. He says, the unassumed is the unhealed. Bless them. He says, the unassumed is the unhealed, but what is united with God is also being saved. Had half of Adam fallen, what was assumed and is being saved would have been half too. But if the whole fell, he is united to the whole of what was born and is being saved wholly. Do you see the point he's making there? If only a little bit of Adam had fallen, then sure, only a little bit of humanity needs to be redeemed. If we're saying that Adam's will hadn't fallen, then fine, why would Jesus need to do that? But isn't the whole point of sin that our wills have fallen? Isn't that the horrible experience of being a sinner? That that which I want to do, I can't. And that that I don't want to do, somehow I do. So here's the key. The unassumed is the unhealed. Whatever the sun does not take on cannot be restored and renewed, cannot be saved. If the sun didn't take on a full humanity, just like ours except without sin, then he wouldn't be able to save us fully. And there could be no saving, healing work on our wills and minds if Jesus didn't take on a human will and mind himself. I won't dwell on it for a long time, but a couple of days ago we talked about the Gethsemane moment. And the Gethsemane moment is almost when the curtain parts a little and you see the two wills of Jesus. What does he say? Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but your will be done. So what's going on there is that Christ in his human will rightly resists the thought of embracing death. That's not what God created the human will to want, ever. It is natural in a good way for Christ to shrink before death because of what death really is. But that human will is exercised by the divine son. And according to the divine son's divine will, he says, your will be done. That's what's going on. One theologian, John of Damascus, more or less says that Jesus submits his human will to his divine will. I don't know what you make of that way of looking at it, but the point he's making there is two wills are happening because in order to save the human will, Jesus took on a human will. So Apollinaris didn't really unite a fully divine nature with a fully human nature. On his view, they were competing for space within Jesus. Do you remember what we looked at on the first day about how creator and creation never have to compete for space? For God to be glorified, there doesn't have to be less of the, create, of the, crea the creature, right? Apollinaris had gotten that wrong. In his view, creator and creature competed within Jesus, and the divine will edged out the human. Thank God that's not what really happens in Jesus. Okay, next slide, please. The next heresy is Nestorianism. And the issue here is a slightly different one. The issue here is about how united the divine and human natures are in the incarnate Christ. 
So basically, uh, the person behind this heresy, Nestorius, is happy to say that there is a fully divine nature and a fully human nature in Jesus. However, he doesn't unite them in one person. At times, he basically says that if there are two natures, there must also be two persons, the Son of God and the Son of Man, he says. Okay, so here's how the question came about, and it was a torrid debate. The question was, can you call the Virgin Mary Theotokos, Mother of God? And the Nestorius, who was then the Bishop of Constantinople, was not comfortable with that. If God has no beginning and no parentage, how can we call Mary God-bearer, Mother of God? So instead he said, let's call her Christotokos, Mother of Christ. There's an ambiguity there that keeps some of the distance. And actually, it seems that Nestorius was offering that as a compromise. What he really wanted was to call her Anthropotokos, which means man-bearer, mother of man. Because he was trying to make it crystal clear that Mary is only the mother of the human being, Jesus, not the divine son of God. Pause at this point. Doesn't that sound reasonable to you? In so many ways, as Protestants, we are allergic to how Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy gives the Virgin Mary this sky-high place in theology and devotion. And it worries us to see it. And so we hear what Nestorius is saying, and we think, oh, that, that must be reasonable. Surely if we went with him, that would keep us from making some of those errors. Actually, no. It wasn't all sympathy for Nestorius back then, and it wasn't just about taking Mary seriously. See, when Christians call Mary Theotokos, or Mother of God, we're not actually saying something about Mary. Actually, those titles say something about Jesus. See, if you say, let's call her Christotokos, Anthropotokos, you may think you're saying something wise about Mary, but the truth is you are saying something seriously wrong about Jesus. And here's the issue which was recognized by Nestorius' great opponent, Cyril of Alexandria. If you can't say Mary is Theotokos, then you are looking at the fetus Jesus in her womb and saying, that's not God. You're not able to say, that there is the Lord God. And that's a huge problem. That's Nestorianism. And in fact, that's what his own teaching and writing reveals. So that when you see Jesus suffering, you can't say the Son of God was doing any of that. You have to say that the man assumed by the Son was. So that Instead of one person at work in the incarnation, Nestorius made it sound as if there were two. Two who's in Jesus to go with two what's. The divine son and the man assumed. If you like your grammar, two subjects of the verbs and two different subjects. And Nestorius would say they had come together in the incarnation, but always to be kept separate, always to be distinguished, so that you couldn't say that the divine son suffered because the divine nature doesn't suffer. You have to say the man assumed suffered. But Cyril would not tolerate ambiguity on this point. And he wrote and acted in a way that pinned Nestorius down. He wanted Nestorius to acknowledge that one of the Trinity, the word of God from John 1.1, was really conceived in Mary and born from her. That one of the Trinity, the word of God himself, died on the cross. Next slide, please. Here's what Cyril is afraid of. I don't think I've put the whole um, quote up, but it's on your outlines if you get the quote outlines um, online. He writes, If the Christ is neither true son nor God by nature, but merely a man like us and an instrument of the Godhead, then we are certainly not saved in God, but rather saved by someone like us who died on our behalf and was raised again by external powers. That's when Nestorius' position would end up. And the truth is, he did go to some very dodgy places. He spoke of the human nature of Jesus as, as just an instrument that would be used for a time in salvation. He spoke of the human nature of Jesus as a temple in which the divine nature would dwell in, but from time to time perhaps move away as well. Particularly on the cross, the divine nature kind of recedes to leave Jesus' human nature to face the full brunt of it. And for Cyril, this is a salvation thing. Because if Christ is not true God by nature, then God wasn't doing it. The man assumed was. And Cyril's point is obvious. We cannot be saved by anyone less than God. I know this is um, deep stuff 
It's taking me years to get my heads around it. So take a breath, but let's keep going and keep your questions for Q&A. Cyril wants to be so clear. The person born of Mary and executed on the cross is fully divine and fully human. And he is only ever one who, only ever one subject, only ever one person doing the verbs and doing two different kinds of things because he has two different natures, but only ever one person doing them. So yes, we look at the person of Christ's activity. We acknowledge two what's, but they are the working of one person. So here's something Cyril wrote in Nestorius, and they, they wrote letters to each other, which are fascinating to read. So it is, we say, that he both suffered and rose again. Not meaning that the word of God suffered in his own nature, either the scourging or the piercing of the nails or the other wounds. For the divinity is impassable because it is incorporeal. Translation, he's saying, of course the divine nature cannot be crucified because the divine nature is beyond time, space, change, and decay. There is no body for God to have in his own divine nature in which to suffer these things. Cyril continues, but insofar as that which had become his own body suffered, then he himself is said to suffer these things for our sake because the impassable one was in the suffering body. The divine son took to himself and inhabited fully a suffering body. And there was not another person operating that body and suffering, but the divine person, the second person of the tree, the logos, the son, doing that in that suffering body. And so Cyril continues, and so we confess one Christ and Lord. This does not mean we worship a man alongside the word, but rather we worship one and the same because the body of the word with which he shares the Father's throne was not alien to him. Again, this does not mean two sons were sharing the throne, but one because of the union with the flesh. But if we reject this hypostatic union as either impossible or unfitting, then we fall into saying that there are two sons. That little phrase, one and the same, is critically important. Irenaeus used it back in the second century. Cyril uses it now, trying to make the point it is the one and the same person suffering these things. It's actually a Philippians 2 point. One and the same son is in very nature God, and one and the same son humbles himself to death on the cross. One and the same. Now, the term hypostatic union, which I haven't put on the slides, shame on me, that gets the heart of things. I read it out just now, and you'll find it in your outlines. Hypostatic union means that two natures are united, union, in one person, hypostasis. That's what that tagline means. Two natures united in one person. And at the Council of Ephesus in 431, although one wing of the dispute was delayed and didn't get there for a while, the council that sat excluded Nestorius' position and backed Cyril. But you know, it was a very challenging time. And when the wing that had been delayed finally arrived, there were excommunications all, all around. It was, it was very messy. And the dust didn't really settle until about 20 years later, when the Council of Chalcedon met to discuss the views of Eutyches. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, if Nestorius scandalized Cyril by treating the two natures as two separate, by distinguishing them too sharply and refusing to speak of the divine son and the human nature as being filled by the divine son, Eutyches had the other problem. He took Cyril's position to the opposite extreme. He was so convinced that the natures had to be seen together that he, he smushed them into one. The incarnation became a blender in which everything came together and the switch went on, and then you had this resulting new nature that was a divine human hybrid. So he insisted that after the incarnation, the joining of the natures was so complete that Jesus just had one nature. The divine and the human blend together to make one new thing. So if you like with Nestorius, Nestorius sees two natures, and so he thinks, aha, two persons. He sees two what's in the life of Jesus, so he thinks wrongly, oh, two who's. Eutyches sees one person and the working of one person, and so he therefore thinks wrongly, only one nature. He sees one who, and therefore thinks only one what. Both of those are errors. And can I say, this takes us back to the fact that I started the second session with. Heresy is about half-truth. And you see, both of them have our half-truths securely in their grasp. 
Which means that if you're dealing with heresy, you can't just swing the pendulum really hard to the other side. Because in so doing, you'll make a mistake. Just because Eutyches hated Nestorius doesn't mean he was right. There's a careful balancing that we need to do. Now, Cyril, by this point, was dead, but the council at Chalcedon took the Roman Western position as a faithful continuation of what Cyril taught. And Leo the Great, he's called, the, the Bishop of Rome, offered uh, something called a tome. It's a little, you can read it online. It's, it's an interesting little statement. The council backed Leo's position as essentially carrying the torch of Cyril and were able, therefore, to exclude Eutyches. And using the work of Leo, but also the work of Cyril, primarily probably the work of Cyril, the council met together and came up with something they called the Chalcedonian definition, or at least we call it that now. And we call it a definition, but it's certainly not the last word on who Jesus is. How could that be possible? But instead, these words set up a space within which we can talk faithfully about Jesus as fully divine and fully human. It's quite long. You can go find it on the internet. But let me read you a chunk of it, a very important moment, maybe the key part. Well, maybe. Anyway, Jesus is said to be acknowledged in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. The differences of the natures being in no way removed because of the union, but rather the properties of each nature being preserved. The Son of God, one person and only ever one person, never parted, never divided into two, but one who became flesh and so took on a human nature. Two natures joined together without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. It was almost a slogan among some of these early church thinkers to say this, remaining what he was, he became what he was not. Mind-blowing, but also beautiful thought. Remaining what he was, he became what he was not. No confusion. So the divine nature is properly and fully divine and not blurred or mixed with the human no change. The human nature doesn't stop being human just because it's joined to the divine and vice versa. No division because they are together as a seamless whole. No separation. In Jesus, divine nature and human nature are united and will never be parted. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, why did this matter so much? Why were there excommunications and such bitter disputes? And as Cyril was saying, and as the Chalcedonian definition underlines, this is a salvation issue. If we get the who of Jesus wrong, then we cut ourselves off from the how of the gospel, how we can be saved. We cannot be saved unless we are brought back to God. And we can only be brought back to God by God himself. Again, it goes back to that first session. He's the creator. There is no creature who could take us all the way to the creator. Only God can do that. So when the word became flesh, if God's nature somehow changed, then we would never be connected to him since Jesus would no longer be him. But if the human nature taken on by the word was somehow changed, then we could no longer be connected to him because Jesus would no longer really represent us. But if when the word became flesh, the son took on a human nature without losing or changing or damaging his divine nature and vice versa, then he really can reveal God to us. And he really can heal our sin-sick nature. He really can save our sin-ruined world. What Chalcedon is working so hard to do is honor the way Philippians 2 works. We read it earlier. You may want to have it open in front of you now because verse 6 shows us that the son was fully personal before entering Mary's womb. And that divine person didn't grasp at the equality of God that he has by nature. He didn't use it for his own advantage. Instead, he used it for ours. Verse 7, what did he do? He made himself nothing the NIV says. He poured himself out. He emptied himself, other translations would say. And at this point, it is possible to go very badly wrong. Did the son empty himself of his divine nature, of his godness? That view became popular among some in the 19th century. And the answer has to be obviously not, because if he could ever have lost it, then he never had it. If he could have lost it, then he was never God in the first place, because God doesn't change. So what is this emptying? What is this making himself nothing? Verse 7 gives us the answer. 
he made himself nothing by taking something on, by taking the very nature of a servant. It's a deep mystery, but if you think about it for a moment, it does make sense. Jesus cannot subtract from his divinity. That's not possible. But he empties himself by adding to it, by taking something on. So that just as he was in the form of God, to be literal about verse 6, he takes on the form of a servant in human likeness in verse 7. This is really important, so let me say it again. When the son empties himself, it is not subtraction. He's not losing his divine nature. It's addition. He's taking on a human nature. And Paul continues through verse 8. This stooping down to our level by taking on a human nature continues because Jesus keeps stooping down to death, becomes humble and obedient to death, and not just any old death, but death on a cross, the most horrible kind of death imagined by the ancient people of Rome, a death designed to humiliate and torture as well as kill. But what Paul is trying to get us to see, especially with the word therefore in verse 9, is that none of that that Jesus experienced made him less God. In fact, only because Jesus is fully God could any of that have happened in the first place. Only the divine nature is so unrelentingly generous, good, and gracious that he would choose to act this way. Only the divine nature, only our Lord God, is so powerful and glorious and life-giving that he could enter into weakness and make it strength. Enter into defeat and make it victory. Enter into death and make it life for us. Only the divine nature could do any of that, but he could only do that in a human nature taken on for us and for our good. And that's why the perfectly divine son became fully human for us. And you know, that is why there is hope for humanity. If you've got Philippians open, do turn to the next chapter, Philippians 3, 20 to 21, and that's where we'll probably finish. So here's the thing. Christ is our future. That's why there's hope for humanity. And what I don't mean by that is that we will become God, we'll be transformed into the divine nature. That is not actually metaphysically possible, but rather in union with Christ, fully divine and fully human, we will come as close to God as it is possible to be. And when we look at the risen Jesus in glory, we see where humanity is headed. Let me finish with this from Philippians 3, 20 to 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. We look to his return, and though now we ache to be with him, parted lovers though we are, the bridegroom will come for his bride and bring us spotless to God. And that will be possible because in the incarnation, God and humanity have already been perfectly united. And when he returns, the real delight, begun now by faith in Jesus, will be ours in full. And the reality of God's fatherhood, which is a reality now by the spirit of adoption, will break upon us in unimaginable splendor. And we will behold God in the face of Jesus and be with him forever. And Cyril and many others are saying, tolerate nothing that jeopardizes that salvation. Tolerate no view of Jesus that makes him less able to be that kind of savior. And aren't we grateful they did? Wonderful. Thank you so much. I would like to give us um, maybe a couple of minutes talking to people next to us, so then we can go into Q&A. As usual, I've condensed and compressed. There is a whole backstory you may want to know about. There are all sorts of questions this may have raised. Chat to your neighbor for a minute. Bring up maybe perhaps some questions or thoughts, and then we'll get to that. Thank you. If we want to draw together... And um, stick up a hand if you've got questions. And uh, feel free to ask questions, perhaps from previous sessions. I hope it's becoming clear. All of them are linked. The truth of, of 
God is, is, is wonderfully one, and we approach it from lots of different angles. So any questions from what we've seen so far? Great. I just want to say a massive thank you for focusing on why all this matters, um, as opposed to just getting lost in theory. So I really appreciate that. Um, a bit on the Trinity seminar and this one as well. How do you walk between this sort of simple, single nature of God hmm. and the dual natures of um, will? Sorry, wills of Christ, without kind of falling into heresy one way or the other. Yes, great question. Thank you. And really, this is also a recap of session one. The key is to realize that in the incarnation, creator and creature, who are entirely distinct, have come together in a way that the integrity of both is maintained and, in fact, secured. And I didn't say this in my material, but what you must not do is that imagine that Jesus is a pair of scales and divine and human perfectly balanced. Don't do that because the divine and human natures are incommensurable. They're not the same thing. One is the creator, one is the creature. One theologian I really like called John McGuckin says, imagine the divine nature as the nurturing matrix in which the human nature grows and develops and is enriched. I found that helpful. I don't know, maybe it's because it's got the word matrix in it. Anyway, so the point there is thinking about the incarnation as the place where creator and creature perfectly meet. Therefore, you realize, actually, when I look at the incarnate Christ, I always have to do a double take. I always have to consider him according to his divine nature and according to his human nature. Only one will in the divine nature, but if he has a human nature, there'll be a will there too. Does that make sense? So with the incarnate Jesus, I see that. And this takes us back to some of the questions we had on Tuesday. Why is it in 1 Corinthians 15, the Son hands over all things to God? It's because we're not talking about the Son in his divine nature. We're talking about the incarnate Christ, now risen in glory, who as the perfect human being hands over all things to God, which is what creation was always meant to be, if that makes sense. Does that, yeah, does that help? Now, within God himself, will is not static, and it's not the way will works in us. And if you're really interested in this, one of the daring and I think sound things that Thomas Aquinas does is he considers how understanding and will in God are realities that talk about a dynamic fullness of life, which is the first step in acknowledging God as triune. He's not barren, he's not sterile. He understands himself. And because when you understand, the thing you understand dwells in your understanding, there is in God a sort of inner otherness. Not an otherness of difference, but an, a union of life. Yeah. That's, that's really a beautiful thought. And the more I think about it, the more I want to praise the Lord. But it's also, a, yeah, a, yeah, think about it. Great. Thank you. Um, practical Hi. implication, could Jesus see the future? In other words, we trust that God will answer our prayers. Hmm. And, but did he know, for instance, he was going to rise from the dead apart from believing the prophecies? Because if he could see the future, he's not so human as we are. Great question. Now, in a sense, I think last night's talk is helpful here too. If Jesus could believe the promises of God as a human being, then he's being perfectly human. And if his own divine nature means he knows that that is what God will do, it doesn't make him less human to trust that. It makes him more human. But to answer your question, there's a sense in which in the incarnation, we see Jesus deliberately withholding the power and the exercise of authority and majesty that he could easily show. So in Matthew's gospel, they come to arrest him, and he says, could I not call 10,000 legions of angels at this moment? But he won't. And so that's part of what's going on in the incarnation, is that he is limiting himself, not because he can't. In his divine nature, there's nothing he can't do, nothing he can't know, that Nick Tucker book, 12 Things God Can't Do, recommended last night, recommended by me too. I saw him do that material once at, at Word Live, and it was fabulous. So in his divine age, there's none of those things he can't do. In the incarnation, for our sake and for our salvation, he chooses to limit himself. And so there's a sense in which in Gethsemane, there's real agony, because his human nature really is plunged into the darkness of all of that. Now, one more quick thing. That doesn't make his suffering less but more. If you think, and a good parallel here might be the question of temptation. People sometimes ask, how tempted was Jesus really if he couldn't sin by nature? But actually, because he couldn't sin, he was tempted much more than any of us. 
What's that Oscar Wilde thing about, um, you know, I can resist anything except temptation? You know, if, if you te are tempted and you immediately give in, you haven't really experienced temptation at its worth. It's the more and longer you resist that you experience how hard it is. Because Jesus never gave himself to sin, he felt temptation at its worst. Similarly, because Jesus, in his divine nature, could know all things, if you like, to embrace the limits of human ignorance means that he was more um, closer than we'll ever be to the difficulty and the doubt of not knowing what's going to happen. It's a paradox, but I think an important one. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, I was just intrigued by your comments over the Mary uh, yes. giving birth to God. Um, now, how do we counter the Catholic sure. kind of view and almost making Mary divine or semi-divine? Sure, sure. Um, given given that uh, yes. fact that you stated. Of course. Well, let me start with this preliminary thing. In wanting to combat one wrong view, we shouldn't let go of something that's true. Mary is to be called Theotokos because, as I said, that's not saying something about Mary. First and foremost, it's saying something about Christ. And of course, let me just reiterate this. Mary does not give birth to divine nature. The divine nature does not get given birth to by human beings. That's simply not what's happening. Rather, she gives birth to the human being whom, who is, there's a very technical term, who is enhypostatized, who is impersoned by the divine son. And because that union is so real, that hypostatic union, we need to be able to say she gave birth to God. Okay, how do we combat um, Catholic and Orthodox? I think we want to say to them, let's regard Mary rightly. She is an incredible older sister in the faith. What a remarkable woman, right? And wouldn't it be amazing, the new creation, to hear how the Lord worked in her life? So we don't want to give ground on the goodness. I think we also gently want to say, but what about all the times in the Gospels where Jesus says even Mary isn't getting it? Mary shows real faith, but there are so many moments where she's like, no, no, come Jesus, and, and the crowd say, look, your mother's calling you, and he says, no, and points to the people sitting around him, whoever hears God's will, whoever hears God's word, they are my brother, mother and brother and sisters. That's a pretty big deal, to, and we need to take it seriously. So I think that might be a good starting point. Thank you. Simple question, which I'd like you to explain more fully. Um, most of us come to know Jesus as our Savior and our Lord through the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross. Mm -hmm. And that brings us in that sense, in our thinking, that then it's like we need Jesus because he died for us to draw us to God through his dying on the cross. In a sense, it seems to divide the two. And can you explain that a little more fully? Thank you. Th thank you. <laughs> you said it was a simple question. Now, I think, I think what the problem here is not a right emphasis on the cross. It's an exclusive emphasis on the cross. We are not simply saved by the death of Jesus because Scripture never says the death of Jesus is an isolated event. Actually, Scripture presents us the death of Jesus as of one piece with the resurrection of Jesus. And you have to see that the only way Jesus can die and rise again, the way he does, is because he is human enough to die and divine enough to raise that humanity to life again. So this is a moment where I don't think we should see separation between the two, and it's probably because we overemphasize one thing. And when I say overemphasize, I don't mean we talk about it too much. We can never talk about the cross too much, but we talk about it the wrong way, as if it's an isolated event, as if Jesus dies on the cross and, brilliant, now let's all come to him. No, he dies on the cross and then rises again, and therefore stands and summons each one of us, come to me, repent and believe. Thank you, though. It's a great question. Thanks so much, Niv. I'm wondering whether in response to that question, also something you said earlier, I don't know which Scottish theologian it was who said that uh, we shouldn't say that God died on the cross, but we do have to say that the one who died on the cross was God, mm. which sounds strange, but it seems to be important. Because also another way in relation to the cross is that um, it's sometimes easy to present the gospel with a kind of angry father punishing yes. a son, Jesus, which is, as John Stotter said, 
we, we shouldn't talk that way of course. because it is the whole of the Trinity that is involved in the act of atonement. Yeah. It's not a third party. Yes, It's absolutely. God and us. And, and the Father and the Son are doing this together. Yeah. And as Hebrew says, by the, by the Holy Spirit, he gave himself. So I think it's quite important that we get the, the, the cross in relation to the whole of godness mm. uh, rather than simply a sort of a three-part thing. The only other thing I wanted to say was I find it so helpful that you're saying that uh, the obedience of Christ is something that, as Hebrew says, he learned yeah. in his incarnate nature. Mm. Um, because that helps us to get over that hump that you were at on Tuesday yeah. uh, of seeing subordination and obedience as something in the eternal trinity that the Son is, was always obedient. Yes. Hebrew says he learned obedience. And even Philippians that you quoted says he became obedient yes. in his incarnate nature. It wasn't something that was there before the incarnation. I don't know whether that helps. Mm. Amen. I think that's so helpful. And it is true that in church history, some people, I think Martin Luther may fall into this category, might say something as bald as God dies. But you notice that Cyril actually was quite careful to say the word because he was talking specifically about how the one who died on the cross is the person of the word in a human nature. Um, this is what's called, by the way, the communication of idioms. And it's because Jesus is one person in two natures, we are able to speak about this one person according to those two different kinds of natures. So you're able to say the word suffered. You're able to say that even though in his divine nature he cannot, but because in his human nature he did. And that's just, uh, it's in the Bible too. It's in uh, the, the classic verse the church fathers looked at was in 1 Corinthians 2. Had they known this, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And they all went, well, of course, the Lord of glory can't be crucified. Otherwise, he's not the Lord of glory. But you can say the Lord of glory was crucified because in his human nature, that's what happened. Thank you. Thanks so much. I was going to ask about what you're saying about it being a salvation issue. Mm. And we were chatting about maybe the person on the cross next to Jesus. Yeah. Um, how much would he have known about Jesus' nature? Yes. And we were wondering, is it about people just coming to Jesus, even if they don't fully understand? I probably won't fully understand. Neither will I. Is. Neither will and I. So yeah, to what extent is it a salvation issue? Thank you. And I, if you go back to two days ago, the point I made was when I say these things are a salvation issue, it's not because you need to have doctoral level understanding of them to be saved. Thank goodness. But rather because the salvation we enjoy by faith alone is possible because of these truths. And, what, and if we don't understand them, of course we don't, fine, but we mustn't deny the truth as God has, has revealed it and as his church has meditated on it. Do you know what I mean? So, so that's the thing. So the person dying next to Jesus on the cross, what would they have known about any of these things? What would he have gotten? But in a really beautiful sense, and because of how the gospel works, he would have gotten everything even though he understood nothing, because he, in a really amazing way, you can only credit to the Holy Spirit, had his eyes open to who Jesus is. And actually, as much as I say he didn't understand stuff, goodness, in Luke 23, he seems to see a lot. We are punished justly for what we've done. But this man has done no wrong. It's a remarkable thing to have seen. Yeah, so the one thing I don't want anyone to take away is that you have to know this stuff and be a massive theology nerd to, to be saved. Now, the Lord does love theology nerds, thank goodness, but he also loves everyone else. And that's why that Lex Randi, Lex Credendi thing was really important. None of these great thinkers, great as they were, would have been able to do anything if it weren't for Christians knowing Jesus. And like I say, reading their Bibles, praying their prayers, going to church, telling the gospel, all of that. Great question, though. Thank you. We were chatting about whether Jesus did the miracles that he did, but in his human nature, mm. empowered by the Spirit, part of, part of the thinking is he did nothing before his baptism, which is the moment when he received the Spirit. Um, and um, quoted from Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Um, is that a right way of understanding Th thank you. miracles and other implications for us yeah. as disciples empowered by the Spirit? Thank you. Two angles on this. Cyril says, actually be very careful of saying Jesus only acted in his human nature. Um, he, he's careful of saying that because he really doesn't want us to be able to separate. And I have heard some people talk as if Jesus was just a human being apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, as if the work of the one God is somehow separable like that. As, as a famous saying in the early church goes, the work of God outside himself is indivisible. 
And therefore, anything the Holy Spirit is doing is what God is doing. And it, it's dangerous if you can imagine the incarnate Christ as somehow in a different box, separate to that. So I'd say be careful. But what's really helped me is a mysterious figure called Pseudo Dionysius says some wacky stuff, but is very much sharpened, neatened, and made wholesome by Maximus the Confessor, then John of Damascus, and then Thomas Aquinas. And he has a beautiful um, formula. He says that he did divine things humanly and human things divinely. And so I think that's a really important and neat way of avoiding the idea that you can partition these things two separately. So it clearly seems to be the case that in what Jesus does in the gospel, it is once he is publicly empowered by the Spirit that he, that he does all these things. And I think you're absolutely right. That's because he's stepping into the Isaiah 61 frame. But at the same time, as the Creed says, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. That's what Luke says. The power of the Most High will overshadow you, that the Holy Spirit will be the one who conceives um, the Lord. So yeah, I think there's a lot in that. But we need to be careful that as we go to those places, we don't separate, we don't bracket. Yeah. Thank you. I think we've got time for one, maybe two, if I'm careful and quick. Can you, just, can you just expand a bit more when uh, in Philippians it says that he emptied himself? Sure. D d is, is that to say that he went as low and low and low so that there's nobody who can say, well, I, he had a bit more than I have? Yeah, no, that's a lovely angle on that. And I think what you're saying is, is certainly true. Rhetorically, that's one of the things Paul's saying. But in the verse itself, what's really curious is that Paul says he emptied, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. So that's the key thing Paul wants us to see, that for the son to pour himself out does not mean becoming less, but taking on a human nature. Um, now this is important because it means that at some level it is not foreign to God's being to pour himself out and to give. But unlike us, when God does pour himself out, it's not that he is ever diminished. He's not like a creature. He's not like a vessel, and to pour a bit out means to have lost a bit. So the only way there can be emptying in the divine life is through this mysterious taking on. Does that make sense? And so again, it's, it's addition, not subtraction. Remaining what he was, he became what he was not. Great question. Thank you. Do you know, we probably do have time for just one more, if there is just one more. Great. Thank you. Is it an oversimplification to say that with the ascension, there is now a man in heaven? Thank you. It's not an oversimplification. That is the gospel. In the gospel, we are saying there is a man in heaven. The key thing that's very difficult for our minds to grasp is what do we mean by, by saying in heaven? You know, when we say that, we imagine a kind of long way away up, potentially, there is a place, and that's where the Son of of God is now. A human being is in there. And, and I think that's just quite tricky because when Scripture talks about heaven, it isn't so much talking about another place in the physical universe we inhabit. You just need to travel a few galaxies to get there. It seems to be talking about a spiritual realm that um, intersects with, interpenetrates with, overlaps with ours, such that, you know, um, the servant's eyes can be opened in, in, in two kings and see these chariots of fire and, and see what's going on. Um, does that make sense? So, our minds are, are, are exploded when we start thinking about these things. But you're not wrong, and it's not an oversimplification. It is the glory of the gospel that there is a human being in heaven and on the throne. And by the way, that gives the lie to what Satan said in the garden. You know, his whole thing was about how God is not out for our good. He wants to keep human beings down. No, look at the gospel, and you'll see what God wants to do for human beings. He wants to put them in the highest place. He wants to join them to himself. And that's what he's done in Jesus. And if we belong to him, the mystery of Revelation is that we get to wear crowns. That's what the elders are doing in Revelation 4. Yes, they're casting their crowns, but they're doing that by their own choice. They've been given crowns and seated on thrones. That's the gospel, possible because a human being is enthroned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tomorrow we're thinking about another set of heresies. We're looking at St. Augustine. It should be great. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.